from Wondery, I'm Matt Ford. And I'm Alice Levine. And this is British Scandal. So Alice, in some ways, Maxwell has been our most epic story. Yeah, it kind of spanned the whole of the 20th century. Second World War, Soviet Russia, Maggie Thatcher... Maxwell had a ringside seat in so many of these major world events. But at the same time, this is also a family story. Yeah, he had a huge impact on his children, of course, Ghislaine Maxwell, which is another whole terrible scandal all of its own. Yes, and that's Maxwell the man. But what about Maxwell the boss? What was he like to work for? OK, so who have we got? We have got a Fleet Street legend. We're talking to Roy Greenslade. He was the editor of the Daily Mirror when Maxwell was the owner. He also worked for Rupert Murdoch and he wrote a book about Maxwell called The Rise and Fall of Robert Maxwell. That's coming up next. So, Roy, you worked as editor of The Mirror, appointed by Robert Maxwell and worked underneath him. Um, But let's start at the start. How did you first meet each other and what was your first impression of him? Oh, well, my wife uh, worked for The Daily Mirror and won an award for some of her reporting. And uh, to celebrate, uh, Maxwell decided to give her dinner and therefore I was invited too. Um, It was at a place, I think, called Maxim's in London, a club, a gambling club. And uh, he behaved outrageously uh, throughout the whole thing. He swept us all the cutlery and and crockery aside to begin with and said, relay the table to the waiters. Um, He uh, was bombastic and difficult throughout, intimidating waiters, intimidating people at the table, uh, except for my wife, who he adored. Um, And then... So I got, a, I got a feeling of him just from that one amazing, drunken, wild evening. And did he have a reputation before you started the job? What was your awareness of him? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, from the moment that uh, one knew Maxwell was going to buy the mirror, um, a lot of people, uh, there were large intakes of breath because his reputation went before him. He'd been a a difficult and silly uh, and rather idiotic MP being called a man who should not steward a public company in an inquiry by the Department of Trade. So he had a pretty poor reputation once he took over the mirror. His reputation then was as a bit of a buffoon because he wanted to have his picture in the paper all the time. He was very demanding of editors. He sacked people on the turn of a sixpence. One can hardly believe that I went to work for him and knowing all this, but um, I had turned down a job for him before that. He would uh, asked me to be deputy editor of the London evening paper that he'd started of the London Daily News and I turned that down thinking you know I desperately don't want to work for this man Uh, but when he came calling the the next time I'm afraid um, the editorship of the mirror the paper that I'd uh, first read as a boy uh, the paper that roughly had my politics the paper that uh, was really could I thought be turned round and I thought He can't surely be worse, as bad at least, as his reputation and can't be worse than working for Rupert Murdoch. Um, So I'm afraid I I walked in, eyes open, uh, ears shut uh, and decided to pick up the baton believing stupidly I can handle him. Uh, Unlike anyone else, I'll deal with him fine. You mentioned his time as a Labour MP. He was MP for Buckingham for six years. Did he have grand political ambition? And how was he viewed in Labour circles? Did Wilson take him seriously? He was an embarrassment uh, to the Labour Party because he made vainglorious speeches in Parliament. Uh, They didn't know what to do with him, so they put him in charge, I think, of the wine cellar, or at least hospitality, uh, where he also uh, apparently misbehaved. Um, But he was boorish. Uh, His ideas were... Uh, protectionist, uh, you know, that he was joined that campaign to buy buy British only, so he had no wider understanding of of capitalism. Strange for a capitalist, but he didn't really grasp uh, the nature of uh, the system that he operated under. Um, and so, I think within the Labour Party, they were. Uh, He was shunned uh, largely by the majority of the party, never promoted, of course, never given an inkling of promotion. Um, 
and, uh, and of course his views were out of kilter with most left-wing MPs and yet at the same time he never forged any kind of links with the right wing either. Well that's what I was going to ask, how much of a Labour man was he? Well, he wasn't really. It was just a, it was a flag of convenience as far as he was concerned. Uh, look, the most important man in Robert Maxwell's life was Robert Maxwell. And anything which he could do to promote himself uh, in the belief that pr- by self-promotion he was advancing himself and the world would be better for his advancement. That's how he, that's how he thought. He had, you know, a massive ego. You know, look, we're dealing here with a psychopath, a sociopath. I don't know what, which way you'd go. Certainly a megalomaniac. And so the, the greater good uh, for the world was always served by anything which Robert Maxwell did and any position that Robert Maxwell held. So, Roy, you get the call then. I'm, I'm guessing out of the blue, a surprise. From day one, did you get a feel for what working with Maxwell would be like? Right, yes, the call itself was very strange. I mean, he, he called on a Boxing Day morning, about 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning, and, um, and the voice came booming. I mean, I'd, like anyone else, I'd had an enjoyable Christmas day uh, the day before. And when his, uh, uh, this booming voice came on the phone, um, and I rolled over and said to my wife, copying the phone, uh, Robert Maxwell's on the phone, we both agreed it must be um, a, fr- a friend of ours called Paul Callan, who was well known for imitating Maxwell. <laughs> so I very shrewdly said, uh, well, thanks, Bob, that's very nice, I will... Uh, Um, can I call you back? Uh, He gave me his number. Noreen knew the number. She said, yeah, that is Maxwell. Even then I thought maybe Callan's up to tricks and he knows the number and I'm going to get... So I rang him back 10 minutes later and uh, he said, I want you and your lady wife uh, to come and see me uh, at lunchtime. Now, at this moment, I didn't know what he wanted. And when we went up to his... I don't know, 10th floor uh, flat uh, next to the Mirror Group. And we're talking about Boxing Day morning, remember? No one else about. Uh, I, I think both Noreen and I fell back on the sofa when he said, I have the honour of offering you the editorship of the Daily Mirror in that very ponderous tone that he had. And I mean, you know, both Noreen and I knew well the, the editor who was there, uh, had respect for him and had no idea. Um, and I, I think we both said, but well, what about Richard? Richard Stott, the current editor? He said, oh, I've got big plans. We've got big plans, Richard and I. So it wasn't as if I was really even robbing someone else's job. He seemed to be suggesting that he was going to look after him. So I still was wary. The whole performance that day was extraordinary and I wanted time to think about it. And he said, I have as much time as you like. Call me later. In other words, make up your mind straight away. <laughs> uh, I, I think we went home, we discussed it all the possible uh, parameters of difficulty that we would face. I mean, my lust, uh, and I ag- agree that's a bad thing to go on lust, but my lust for the editorship of The Mirror persuaded me, I persuaded myself that I would be OK. So I'm afraid I gave in to wild ambition. I was very happy in the job I had. I was uh, uh, number three on the uh, Sunday Times. I'd been there three years. I was enjoying the job. I got on well with uh, Andrew Neil, the editor, um, and I was well placed perhaps one day to have even advanced there. So I don't know. I, I threw it all up and, and decided to take it anyway. The relationship between proprietor and editor is always a fascinating one, particularly when it's Robert Maxwell. Was he hands-on or hands-off as a boss? (laughs) Uh, He only knew (laughs) hands-on. You know, I'd been used to working uh, at The Sun and at The Sunday Times where everyone was always uh, second-guessing, I suppose, Rupert Murdoch in one way or another. Even though I worked with tough editors, Kelvin McKenzie at The Sun and Andrew Neal at The Sunday Times, and they um, handled uh, uh, Murdoch pretty well. Uh, But Murdoch really didn't interfere that much. 
When I got to the mirror, I found that Maxwell micromanaged every area of the place. In every way, he interfered. He interfered in the advertising, he interfered in the management, he interfered even to the extent of, of sacking, you know, sports reporters or news desk flunkies and so on. Uh, anyone uh, that he could lay hands on at any time, uh, he tried to sack. Um, there were difficulties about reinstating them afterwards or even pretending you'd fired people when you hadn't and so on. He wanted to know what was in the paper. He wanted to be involved in every aspect uh, of the of the uh, of the running of the paper so he was the most interfering boss one could ever imagine you know he he really basically wanted to be the editor um and uh, at the same time he didn't have any of the skills uh, to be editor he had wildly impossible views about what should be in the paper and what shouldn't um, and wildly, of course, grandiose uh, views of his own contacts and ability and so on. I mean, you know, he, he had no political grasp at all beyond a lot of help from a, from the se a senior man called Joe Haynes, who, who was his biographer, of course, uh, and was the leader writer of the, of the Daily Mirror. And he took most of his po political sounding from Joe. Uh, anyway, it was skewed. It was difficult because the other thing Maxwell did is that he consulted people around you all the time so that you didn't know what what he'd been talking about to other people he didn't believe really in any hierarchy or uh, and so on he would he would pick up his information or or badger people into making into giving up information um which you as the editor didn't know about can you think of any specific examples Roy of those moments where he overreached or he interfered well, uh, one of his great moments of interference was if you dared to take a day off. My wife and I, not long before, bought a house in Ireland and we risked, and I, I think it was in the first five, six weeks, a quick trip across to Ireland. He rang uh, and said, uh, I want to see you. And I said, well, I can't get back from Ireland. I'm coming myself, he said. I said, how are you getting here? He said, helicopter. I said, Bob, there's a war on in where we live in, in Donegal. You, they, you won't get permission. I, said, I will get permission. Of course, he didn't get permission. Uh, but in his frustration, uh, he rung the sports desk and didn't like the attitude of the young man who answered the phone and fired him. So I then got calls from the sports editor saying he's fired one of my best men, what are you going to do about it? So we gave up being in Ireland and flew back and I had to reinstate this guy, tell Bob he couldn't do that sort of thing. Uh, he, of course, was apparently contrite, yes, you're quite right, yes, that shouldn't happen. Um, so and and that that kind of thing happened i suppose five or six times of firing people which was always very difficult because it's the worst thing these these people look to you as the editor to to save them and so on um and uh, and of course his other thing was he'd ring when you went home at night should you dare to go home uh, and he never slept and never worried about time he would ring the news desk and demand that they publish some story or other that he'd got a half uh, an interest in or um, that he that he that somebody some old friend had rung and told him or somebody in the city had mentioned and of course they had to they had this difficulty what do they do this is not a proper story it's not a daily mirror story and he was always doing that i mean he rang me once and said um i've got your splash for you tomorrow uh, my heart sank when bob said he got a splash <laughs> Uh, and he said, uh, I'm calling you from Israel, where I've just bought the two major teams in Jerusalem. Imagine, Ro Rangers and Celtic, I bought them both in uh, Israel. There's, there's your splash. So I said, well, Bob, and he went, you're going to defy me, aren't you? You're going to defy, you're always defying me, and slammed the phone down. So, you know, that, that was fairly impossible. But I think the major example of madness was when he rang me one day and said, uh, what's on your front page tomorrow? And I said, well, uh, Bob, it's amazing. Um, Russian troops have gone into Lithuania 
and surrounded the media uh, centre. Um, and it's almost as if it's a, a re-invasion um, uh, that Gorbachev has launched. And there was a long silence. He said, Mr. Green said, you are an idiot. Actually, I am saying idiot. He called me a four-letter word which began with C. So, you know, a pretty grim conversation. <laughs> Uh, and I said, why is that, Bob? He said, because Gorbachev wouldn't do anything without calling me first. <laughs> Wild. There you go. Uh, another example. Let me give you another example. Said that these things flow out of you when you talk about Bob Maxwell. <laughs> when the first Gulf War broke out, 1990, uh, I, got, uh, I, I commissioned, a, uh, assigned um, a good reporter and a good photographer to go out immediately. Uh, one of them uh, rang the news desk and the news desk rang me to say that they ha are not taking off from Heathrow uh, because they'd been called in before setting out by Bob Maxwell uh, and told that their job when they got out to uh, I Iraq was to locate troops in the trenches and sell them encyclopedias. <laughs> Bob Bob had got this uh, ancient stack of Caxton encyclopedias that no one wanted uh, and he'd got an agent in, he'd sent out to Doha and was expecting his journalists to sell encyclopedias to the troops <laughs> you know I, of course I told them you know no such thing will happen and he forgot about it you never knew what he'd remember and what he'd forgot but anyway he gave up on that one Some of the things he got involved in, at the time, tabloids had all sorts of competitions. People of my generation and older will remember Spot the Ball, even local papers did it. And for those of you too young to know what it was, you would get a picture of a moment in a football match, usually where at least two players would look like they were going up for a header, and you would have to mark on the picture with a biro, I think you got ten different crosses to put around the place, where you thought the ball was, and if you matched where... Either the ball was or where the expert panel said the ball was, you won £100, £1,000. In Maxwell's case, a million. But there was something different about the way the mirror ran it, wasn't there? <laughs> yes. So he decided we needed to get one up on the sun and have a big million prize of a million pounds for a spot the ball competition. But then when he decided this, and I think it was a meeting in his room involving the promotions director, great and straightforward and straight up honest man called John Jenkinson and, uh, and myself and I think somebody from the advertising department and as we all agreed that this would be fun and we could uh, outrank the sun as we were leaving he called back John Jenkinson and myself and said of course no one must win and I said, well, how's, how's that going to work? He said, you can always place the ball where no one can find it. And I, I thought, well, that, that's not quite in the spirit of the thing. But, outrageous. Yeah, out, outrageous indeed. And I, uh, to my great regret, I said uh, to John Jenkins, well, how can we do that? And John said, well, uh, it's doable. Um, now, I left the mechanics up to him and, and so on, and I just turned a blind eye. One or two readers did complain that it was farcical, but I'm afraid I let it go, thinking, look, no one believes these competitions are straight or believable anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But I'm afraid once that reached public knowledge, and it reached public knowledge, people think that it leaked out. In fact, when I wrote my biography of Robert Maxwell, I confessed to that one, which is been held against me ever since for some reason but I just have to put up with that I'm afraid it was a Bob Maxwell decision and uh, I lived with it and um, it was the beginning of what would of course become his belief that he could do anything and would indeed in the end when he asked for something too much would lead to me uh, quitting. You've described his ego and his love of power and influence and also your experience with Rupert Murdoch. How big of an inspiration was Rupert Murdoch on Bob Maxwell? Maxwell is obsessed with Murdoch. Murdoch, whatever one might think of him, was hugely successful, clever, clever, 
uh, thoughtful uh, and strategic. Uh, Maxwell was not clever, not thoughtful, uh, and uh, had no concept of strategy. Uh, but um, he modeled, he, he believed he could be as big and was as important as Rupert Murdoch. So everything Murdoch did, he watched it. Uh, he had, of course, a bad history in the sense that uh, he tried to take over the sun. Uh, oh, sorry, first, he tried to take over the news of the world in 68 uh, and Murdoch beat him. He tried to take over the sun in 69 and Murdoch beat him. He tried to take over the Today newspaper and Murdoch beat him. Murdoch beat him to uh, introduce computer technology. Murdoch beat him to expand into the United States uh, and to go global. So in every way, uh, Maxwell was the loser but it was his obsession to try and beat him to try and be as big as him which drove him and annoyed him and irritated him whereas on the other side I know from Murdoch that he just Murdoch would just found it extremely amusing and didn't take Bob Maxwell seriously they're often obviously grouped together partly because as you say they they fought it out for the ownership of the news of the world and the sun and today um it sounds like they're fundamentally different people and not just in terms of the way that um, they approach business, but Murdoch's ability to delegate within his organisations, a, a, a trait that it sounds like Maxwell didn't possess. That's right. Murdoch did have a sense of delegation. Look, he was interfering in with his senior staff too. Uh, he too is a megalomaniac uh, and he too gets his, gets his own way within his organisation, but he's cleverer at it. And most importantly, he did it at the discreet level. Um, and so there was no public bombast from Murdoch. Murdoch avoided uh, speaking in public, didn't seek the limelight. Bob did the opposite, which made him into a buffoonish character in a way that uh, Murdoch didn't. Murdoch suffered from the fact, or perhaps benefited, when you actually think about it, from the fact that when he first came to Britain, in 1968, he, he was interviewed on television by David Frost and suffered from Frost's questioning him, cross-examination, as it were, and that really hurt Murdoch. And so he thought, well, I'm never going to do that again. And it taught him a lesson about being unprepared um, for the kind of quizzing on TV that exposes you. Um, so he never did that again. It, it was a, and so, something that Max will never learn because he had no, he had a thick skin and he had no sense of himself. So he didn't even realise when people were actually taking the mickey out of him. It sounds like now, Roy, you have this great clarity about Maxwell, about his psychology, about his motivations. But then... Was there a turning point? Was there a moment that made you feel that you wanted to or that you had to leave the mirror? Look, it was accumulation of things. I've mentioned some of the madness. My days became weary. My wife could see that it was impossible because she was much more subtle in her handling of, uh, of Maxwell. He was much nicer to her. She didn't have, of course, the senior position on the paper, so she didn't have to take the kind of decisions. Um but it became uh, intolerable and really uh, there had to be a moment uh, where the straw would break this camel's back. And it came when he demanded that I publish uh, an offer uh, in the paper for pills that he claimed would improve the IQ of school children. My God. The astonishing thing was that we discovered that uh, he had uh, uh, financial interest in the company producing the pills. The nutritionist that he got on board was at the end of his life and was probably being manipulated. Um, and I had a terrible feeling about the kickback, the backlash that would come from persuading people that giving uh, tablets to their children day after day to improve their IQ would would really I just didn't feel I mean I could stand over spot the ball as a bit of nonsense but I couldn't have people across Britain forcing their children to take tablets well on the on the basis that they would improve their children's school performance that just so I just refused point blank to publish it Maxwell sent you know good people to me uh, uh, to try and persuade me 
otherwise, but I just refused. And so I think he sent Kevin, his son, as the final uh, persuader. Now, I'd not much time for Kevin. Not uh, He wasn't awful, Kevin, but I'd not much time for him. Within a week, I was gone. You mentioned Kevin there. Obviously, Ian was around as well, and there's a lot of contemporary interest in Ghislaine. Did you ever see Robert and Ghislaine together? What was their relationship like? The interesting thing about the children was that he was pretty rude to the boys in front of people. Uh, Ian, I ought to say, was smooth and charming and delightful. Uh, Kevin was a bit more edgy and difficult. I think I flew to Berlin on Maxwell's behalf when he bought um, newspapers in in, uh, East Berlin after the fall of the wall. And um, I, I went with Kevin. I was he was impressive uh, in his dealings with people and so on, um, but always having to keep in mind that he was acting on behalf of a father who was mercurial in his decision making. By contrast, on the one major occasion uh, that I. I met Maxwell when Ghislaine walked in. I was up in his office one night and we were alone uh, discussing, uh, as very often in the evening, discussing life and uh, and Murdoch and um, other things. And um, Ghislaine suddenly appeared and he said, well, I've heard, what's this business about you jumping out of a helicopter on water skis? And she went, oh, that was just a bit of fun, Daddy. And... Um, and then it had become clear that she had dived over the side of a boat and hit her head on a pole, and she did uh, risk her life. But she was very light with him, giving him kisses on his cheek and so on. And um, he he said, I never want to hear about this again. Uh, You be careful in future. And she left. And as she left, I said to him, children, eh? Uh, And he went, well, yeah, she's a very naughty girl. But I could see how much, uh, in in different, a different way, he treated her from the way he treated uh, Kevin and Ian. He was soft with her. She was a favourite. And that's probably the reason he named the yacht after her and so on. Um, he, he was indulgent with her in a way that I'd never seen him be with either of his sons. Did he ever talk about his background? Were you aware of his childhood, his upbringing? Oh, yeah, he did. Um, uh, you didn't have to push him very much to talk about that. Um, he talked about um, uh, mostly the war. Uh, he said how he'd found it necessary to kill people in the war, to execute, in fact, someone, a mayor, I think he, he talked about. I, I think that's that's on record somewhere as well. Occasionally, just occasionally, He'd talk about how he'd made his way across Europe, but he didn't. He ne- He didn't talk about the Holocaust to me, anyway. There was no reference really to what he'd lost. It was all, I think, uh, hidden away. F- I mean, because he'd not even assumed in public his Jewishness for a considerable period of time. It was, in fact, oddly and ironically, his wife who formed this um, uh, organisation for uh, Christians and Jews to to be together. It was not until she got heavily involved that he really made much more in public of having been a Jew. Just thinking about the downfall of Robert Maxwell, obviously one of the things that he's really known for is plundering the Mirror Group newspaper's pension fund. I mean, this must have affected people that you'd worked with, maybe even affected you personally, Roy, are people still sore about the money they lost out on? Uh, to be honest, um, so cataclysmic was the discovery of the missing £600 million, uh, in the pension fund that the government stepped in and laws were passed, compensation funds were set up. In fact, it was only relatively small amounts of people in obscure printing department, printing areas, printing companies that he owned that really suffered losses and even those were made up later Um, but of course what it did was it 
absolutely terrified people that they were going to lose their money. It was, I mean, this thing took a couple of years to sort out. Um, so, no, I, d I don't think we can say that people suffered. I mean, my wife was a major, uh, had been at the Mirror for so long. Obviously, hers, uh, her pension was in jeopardy at that time. Um, and uh, it's true that even today, um, that there's a, a strong pensioners' organisation. Uh, everyone pays attention to who gets elected to look after their pensions. It remains a, a matter of, of great nervousness. Um, I, I, by the way, on a personal level, I just didn't trust the man, of course, the, uh, following the IQ pills drama. I just didn't trust him anymore. So I took my pension out. As I left, part of the deal was that I could take my pension away. I guess the point is that those people were rescued by legislation and by uh, the law. Maxwell himself was fully prepared to let those people lose their money. Oh, yeah. Well, was he? And this is one of those moot points. And I and I have some sympathy um, with those that believe that he genuinely believed he was only borrowing the money. I, I think it's really important to grasp this. I, I don't think he was a criminal in the sense that we think of him actually believing that he was going to get away with uh, uh, milking the, the pension funds for 600 million. His whole strategy, if there was a strategy, um, in, in financial terms, was to keep switching money from account to account, from country to country, um, stealing from Peter to pay Paul in reverse and so on. And so he believed by circulating the money, he could keep everyone happy. So I think he got himself into it. I, I mean, look, it was a criminal act. There's no doubt about that. And I think that was a major contribution to my belief that he committed suicide. So I think there was an understanding uh, that uh, he he believed he was borrowing it and that he would pay it back of course you know many a robber many a burglar especially white cr collar criminals believe they are roughly doing the same so it's not it's not a great argument on his behalf but as to him setting out to appall people I d uh, and and to steal from them i don't believe that he, he thought of it in those terms you you say uh, kind of pointedly, you believe that um, he took his own life because, of course, there were conspiracy theories swirling. Do you remember the moment you heard about his death? The editor of the Today newspaper, my great friend Martin Dunn, ran towards me screaming, Max was gone down, his plane has gone down, you've got to come and write everything that you know, that ever, all those stories you tell, please come now. Well, by the time we got, I was sat at a desk, we knew that it wasn't a plane, it was the yacht. I think his body had been found uh, by that time. And I sat at the desk uh, with all these memories of Maxwell swirling about me. I mean, I'd only gone six months before, five months before. Um, and for the first time, and indeed the only time in my journalistic career, I couldn't at that moment write. I couldn't perform in the way that I'd been trained for all my life. And I had to uh, call my wife and say, look, I did some notes. Can you fax them to me? Those great days of fax machines. And a sort of very faint uh, group of notes came across and that stimulated me back into action. Not one of my greatest pieces. Um, and even though I told lots of funny stories, they were somewhat toned down in order to be slightly kinder. There was a feeling, I suppose, Murdoch didn't want to be seen to be dancing on Maxwell's grave at that moment. Um, and it was four weeks before we found out about the pension pun fund plunder. So my piece was slightly kinder than it might have been. And now, in retrospect, how do you feel about him? Do you ever miss him? <laughs> no, I never miss him. Um, no, I think I put him in context as the years move on. Um, I see him for what he was. Um, I'm often reminded about the funny stories uh, involving him. Not, uh, you know, I, and so the, the badness, as it were, um, I, I kind of overlook nowadays. I, I see him in the context of his background, you know, escaping the Holocaust, losing his family. Um, I, I see him as a man on the make uh, 
uh, who didn't believe in uh, in rules because rules have been no good for him in the past. Um, I see him as a rugged capitalist buccaneer um, on a scale that I've seen other people um, ever since. I have him. I have him not as a bad man, uh, uh, certainly a stupid one, but uh, stupid and clever at the same time. I mean, who else? could have lived like he did, private plane, private helicopter, private yacht, uh, running many, many companies, and yet doing it all by fooling us into believing that he had a great pile of money in Liechtenstein when he had nothing at all. I mean, it was an amazing financial juggling act, and I suppose there's some skill in that, even if that skill means that you turn out in the end to be a, a robber. Well, that's the thing. What you've described is certainly not a traditional out-and-out charmer. So it's kind of incredible that he got away with what he did for so long. When he wanted to charm you, he could, though. I mean, um, you know, he he could be very nice. He was very... You probably already realise there are many contradictions about him. One of the contradictions was that he was a rather dainty man. A friend of mine actually had an affair with him. And she talked about how gentle he was in bed, how dainty he was. She used to use the word dainty. And um, it, it, it is odd to think that... And, and he got these quite small feet and he was very light on his feet. Um, and he could, when he wanted you, he could charm you. He got great manners. Then against all that, he was boorish uh, and mercurial and difficult and careless of other human beings who didn't do his bidding. So he was both those things at once. Is it fair to say at times as well he was he was vulnerable? I mean, I've read various books about him, we've covered him in, in this series. He seemed to suffer at times from deep shame and at times almost behaved like a, an animal who'd been caught eating food. Do you recognise that part of his character? Yes, I do. I mean, that's right. He was, I suppose, look, his vulnerability would be that he had been a lucky young man to have escaped, uh, to have a life, as it were. And um, look, they ended up in Auschwitz. I talk about him as not caring about rules um, and being a rule breaker or not even knowing that the rules existed. But you've got to think that for him, the very fact that he'd managed to make it, that was a triumph in itself. And he felt, I think, both vulnerable and invulnerable at the same time. So that did give him a fragility, which um, made him, I suppose, which was one of the reasons he, he acted the way he did. Of course, the official narrative is that he had a heart attack. Why don't you subscribe to that? Uh, well, no, I, 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 I don't. I'm afraid. I, 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 you've got to think he's on this boat, and he, he'd done some strange things in the lead up to the boat. He had the plane fly overhead. He never took long breaks alone. Um, uh, so that was in the build up. That was very strange indeed. Only he knew that he was going to be pressed for fifty four million pounds. He didn't have and that he'd been pressed and pressed. He knew that in the investigation that would follow that, the chances of him going to jail were very great indeed. He couldn't possibly take the ignominy that that would involve. And um, I I think he, he therefore knew that he was going to take his own life. Uh, that's that's the build-up. That's the reason I think that. But then when we get to the actual physical matter of the yacht... I tried to actually reproduce the conditions under which um, he went over the side of the boats. And so I went to a yacht exactly uh, the same as his that was in dry dock at Portsmouth with two of the crew that had been on the yacht. And we experimented trying to throw ourselves off, trying to see if he'd step between the rails and so on. And it, it proved impossible to believe after a while that he could have done it accidentally that it that he'd toppled over that he'd had a heart attack and toppled over none of that in the context of the of the railings on the yacht and so on made any sense whatsoever the key piece of evidence for me is that the stateroom as he called his bedroom uh, was locked 
And I believe that what Maxwell did, knowing what he was going to do, was remove the key so that no one could get in. And that gave him time. It meant he wouldn't be suddenly discovered. And I believe he let himself down over the side of the yacht. His muscles and his uh, arm were torn. It's a typical way to commit suicide, not to jump, but to gradually let yourself down. And then I think he floated and he died of basically of hypothermia uh, rather than a heart attack. That's my belief. And I will take that to my grave in the in the belief that it was a suicide. Roy, this has been a, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. OK, well, it was my pleasure, too. <laughs> Our thanks to Roy. His book is called The Rise and Fall of Robert Maxwell. Next week, we've got a new story, and it's your turn, Alice. Yes, next we're taking on the story of the spy cops. This is the final episode in our series, Maxwell. I'm Alice Levine. And I'm Matt Ford. This episode was produced by Dee King. Our senior producer is Joe Sykes. Our executive producers are Jenny Beckman, Stephanie Jens and Marshall Louie for Wondering. 